Hello, and welcome back. Um, today, again, we're going to be doing something a little bit different, sort of keeping with the theme of looking at some other array languages besides APL. Um, today, we're going to be looking at an advent of code problem, 2021, day 14. And we're going to be solving it in NGN K. Um, a uh, small disclaimer before we get started, but uh, K is probably the array language that I'm least familiar with. So there's there may be better ways to do things in terms of uh, workflow or the solution. But I think that we have a cool array-based solution for this problem that highlights some unique features of K. Um, and I'm excited to show it to you. Um, a few quick words on K. Um, it's uh, quite a bit different than the other array languages. Um, it's vector-based, so it doesn't focus on like large uh, rectangular higher rank arrays. Um, it is written in ASCII, so no fancy glyphs, but um, arguably makes it easier to uh, use using just a standard keyboard. Um, and it also has a history, uh, you know, it was written by Arthur Whitney originally, and there's like nine versions of it, I guess, most of which are um, proprietary and are used to do dark magic uh, time series stuff at like hedge funds and banks and whatnot. But there is an open source implementation created by uh, NGN, very, very smart dudes. Um, and I'll link this uh, repository in the video description. Uh, there's also some really nice educational resources for uh, NGNK. Um, there's uh, two books, one by uh, XPQZ, who's pretty active in the APL community as well. I think he works at Dialog now, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, this is a great book, describes all the sort of verbs and kind of the, the underlying um, vector model. And then there's another great book, uh, Work in Progress, I think, uh, by Raise Time that um, also does a very nice breakdown of, um, you know, how to use K and, and also has chapters like uh, thinking in K or thinking in an array language that's uh, probably useful for, for newcomers to the paradigm. So I'll link all of these in the description um, if you want to dig more into this language. Okay, so 2021, day 14, um, again, skipping, you know, a bunch of flavor text and sort of getting to the point. The idea is that you have a starting string, so in in CB in this case, and then there's a blank line, and then there's a bunch of transformation rules. And the idea is that when you see this pair or these characters next to each other in the string, in a single iteration, you are meant to insert the character uh, B between them. So CH uh, with a transformation rule of B would result in the string CBH, right? And um, the idea is that you take your starting string and you apply these transformation rules, basically inserting characters um, between every, uh, every pair in the string. And the question is, um, so after 10 transformation steps, um, you look at the characters in the string and you take a count of each one and you, sub, uh, you take the maximum count from those characters, you subtract the minimum count and that becomes your answer. Um, now in classic advent of code style, you might look at this and you might say, oh, well, you know, I can just like, uh, I can just like build a string or maybe I can be fancy and like use the link, linked list or something and um, just, you know, build the, build the string and count the characters at the end. But of course, part two says, oh, actually we're going to need to do this, uh, you know, for a total of 40 steps. And in case it's not uh, obvious, this um, basically inserting a character between every pair in the string is uh, an exponential, an exponential growth function. So when you do, um, when you do, you know, 40 times your string, 
you know, you can look at these character counts. These all occur like a bajillion times. So you will pretty quickly run out of memory and or wait for uh, weeks or months to, to solve this if you do this sort of naively. The strategy we're going to be doing um, is, you know, if you look at the problem description, uh, this is a little bit like there's a problem in previous years called like lanternfish or something like that. But the insight is basically that you don't care about the position of any of these pairs. Um, you just care about um, the count of each pair, right? And then at the end, you have some sort of function to like map um, from your pair counts to your character counts. And you can do your uh, max minus min calculation. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is um, like a couple of the other problems that we solved recently, um, we're basically going to build a matrix, um, like a like a graph or a transition matrix, where each row will represent one of these pairs, and then um, the numbers in that row will denote um, how many how many pairs are generated, uh, or which pairs are generated when we apply the transition rule. So like when we, uh, you know, when we generate a row in the matrix for CH to B, we will, um, it'll be zeros everywhere except for CB and BH, and we'll have ones at those locations. Um, that is the strategy. And, you know, by doing this and basically by grouping, grouping by pairs instead of building the string, um, it should very easily fit into memory and um, the, the, the runtime should be pretty minuscule. Um, okay, so K, um, you know, you run it in, uh, <laughs> you run it in a, in a, in a terminal, um, pretty novel concept, you know, using the terminal and like writing your solutions in text files rather than like workspaces with APL. <laughs> um, but uh, you have to build it from source. I'm not sure that there are uh, releases, so you'll need like a you'll need like a C compiler and um, all that sort of jazz. And uh, you know, if you want a real trip, you can look at the C code <laughs> that underlines in G and K. It's written in a very specific style. Um, so you can just do RL wrap um, your K executable and then uh, load a uh, REPL file. And the REPL file in addition to you know, giving you a REPL, you also get like um, some very terse uh, help functions. So this backslash gives you, um, backslash is sort of the top level of this. And then if you're curious about verbs, for instance, or, or functions as we call them in APL, you do like backslash plus. And this is called, um, I think they call this the ref card in K. And it's just like, it's like very terse documentation about all the different um, functions. So uh, you can take a look at that. I kind of, the thing about K that I like is I think that it's like very, um, it's like very practical. Um, so there are a limited number of primitives because they're not using glyphs. Um, they're sort of limited by the, the ASCII character set. Um, but the primitives that they do choose are uh, like very useful for the types of problems that you want to solve. I feel like in other array languages, they kind of take a more principled stance. Like a good example is like splitting a string, right? I mean, especially if you're doing like advent of code problems, you're splitting strings all the time. Um, hang on, let me kick out my cat real quick. And I feel like with other array languages, they'll be like, oh, well, that's, you know, we're not going to include a primitive for that because that's like a special case. So it'll come up with like three or four other like beautiful kind of general primitives, you know, group and classify and all this stuff. And then they'll be like, yeah, now you can split strings, but it takes 10 characters to do it. Meanwhile, in K, they're just like, yeah, well, we see that our users are like splitting strings a lot. So here's a string split primitive. Um, <laughs> so I kind of like that about it. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into it a little more as we, um, uh, as we solve some stuff here. Okay. So in order to read our problem input, uh, we just do zero colon rather than, you know, ingots or um, 
other stuff in other array languages, and we have our input here in 14.txt. And we can assign this to p. The colon here is the assignment operator, among many other things. Um, we can drop the two uh, top rows using underscores drop here. And um, we can apply that handy string function that I was talking about. So for each row, and this, um, this apostrophe here is each, string split is backslash, and we will split on this um, separator string here. And now um, each row has uh, two strings in it. We'll call this like R for uh, the rest of the strings, I guess. Um, and then uh, if we take the first element of every row in R, so again, we're using each with apostrophe and uh, asterisk here is first, um, then we can, uh, we can convert all of these into symbols using the cast function. So dollar sign, again, among other things, I'm gonna say among other things a lot because there are a ton of overloads in K um, depending on like the types of the arguments that, that you feed it on either side. Um, we can convert it into symbols and um, symbols are awesome. Um, you know, if you worked with like Lisps or I think maybe like Ruby has them, but the idea is that instead of, um, instead of having like arrays of strings, you can in turn, um, you can in turn them into symbols. And that's really nice because it reduces memory usage. So multiple copies of a symbol don't have any additional memory overhead. And then you get nice things like um, equality comparison between symbols is going to be done in constant time rather than like linear time if you wanted to do equality between strings. Um, so we have our list of symbols and we'll call this like I for identifiers. And let's see, so I have another tab open and I'm just going to be copying over um, text into Vim here as we go along. Okay. So that's our, um, that's sort of parsing our input. Um, we want to, so as I mentioned, our strategy, we want to build rows of kind of a transition matrix, right? And so as an example, we can look at like the, first row of p is going to be our starting string. And so we can write a function that operates on strings like this. Functions are defined by these curly brackets. And then you have um, just like alpha and omega in APL, you have some uh, kind of like predefined function names. So uh, it goes like x, y, um, x will be like the function on the left y or, or x will be like the value on the left, y is the value on the right. And then you have more, you get like z if you want to call a function with a third, uh, with a third argument. And then um, I think there's more, I think it wraps around to like a and b, but I haven't written any four argument functions. So uh, double check that one. Anyway, um, so the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna convert a string like this into a list of pairs. And so we can do a, uh, we can use the windows function on X. This is sort of like a, uh, oh, and we have to apply this. I haven't quite figured out when apply has to be used when versus when it doesn't, but to be safe, you can just use apply when in doubt. Anyway, the window function will sort of scan the string and we'll apply like a sliding window in this case of length two. And we just get all of the, um, kind of contiguous uh, substrings there. And again, we can convert these into uh, symbols like so. And now we can group them using the uh, equals function here. And group works really just like the key operator in APL. Um, you get, uh, you know, it, it, it will um, look at all the unique elements in your array, and then we'll give you the indices where that element occurs. But unlike in APL, you get this new, uh, you get this new data type, uh, a dictionary. And uh, dictionaries are awesome. 
this is a unique feature decay that I haven't seen in other uh, array languages. Um, but they work. They basically work just like uh, they basically work just like arrays, including their performance characteristics. So don't get too excited. There's not um, you know there's not like constant time access like you might expect with a uh, hash table in other languages. But basically, a dictionary is just an array where the the keys instead of being the natural numbers, right? So you can think of an array as when you index into it, it's kind of like a dictionary where the keys are natural numbers. Um, but here the keys can be whatever you want. In this case, they're symbols. And we can do stuff like, um, you know, you can basically just index into them. Uh, so like if I wanted, you know, uh, the symbol fh, I get the uh, according list. So pretty handy. Um, but anyway, we're not really interested in the indices where things are. Instead, we just want to know how many occurrences there are in the um, in our string. So we can do for each length. And you can see we have some symbols that have two occurrences. Most of them have one. Um, and now we're going to make use of another really nice feature of k. Um, so because this is a dictionary, we can index into it using our uh, list of identifiers. Um, but not all of the identifiers are guaranteed to be present in this, um, in this dictionary that we built. However, um, you can see that where, where those elements are not present, we get null values denoted by uh, zero in here. And this is really nice. Uh, just to give you an example, so like if we did you know, iota 10, this exclamation mark where it says iota here. Um, and then let's say that we wanted to index into it, we can index like, uh, you know, 7, 8, 11, 4, 16. You can see that um, rather than getting an error, like, a, like an index out of bounds error, you just get these null values. And those are handy because you can use things like the null fill function, this upper caret here, and you can provide kind of like a default value. So there's a really nice way to, to provide like, you're indexing into something and if it's not in the array or dictionary, then you can supply some sort of default value instead. Um, so for our function here, we will use this null fill function. And this is now a, um, this is now a vector that, uh, so for each, each identifier in our list of identifiers, we now have a count of how many times that, um, that pair occurs in a string, right? So we can call this function, uh, we can call this like B for build, I guess. And now, for example, if we wanted our, uh, if we wanted our starting vector, we can run B on the first row of our problem input and we get our starting vector, which we'll call S. And let's copy some of this over. So we have our build function, and we have our starting vector. OK. And now we want to build our sort of graph or transition matrix. And so let's take a look at R for the rest of the input, or rules. I guess could be another meaning for R. And the idea here is that we want to, um, so we have like a string of two characters in the beginning, and we have a single character string at the end, and we want to combine them into a three character string with this uh, second element in between. And so like, let's just say that we had like a, uh, you know, we'll take, so we have VS, and if we do a uh, comma, it enlists it, or basically, basically it will move it will move an array into um, uh, one rank higher. So if you have a plain vector, you can think of this now as like uh, a one by two matrix, right? And because it's a matrix, we can transpose it. So now we get the elements um, we get the elements sort of separated like this. And just like we have string split, we have string join, uh, forward slash instead of a backslash. 
So we can do like, I don't know, C to kind of join between these characters. And now we get VCS. So if we, for each R, we're going to apply a function. This uh, period here um, basically says like, if you have a list of arguments, you kind of feed them to a function so that each argument uh, gets its own um, predefined variable. And our second argument is going to be Y. So we do enlist Y transpose and then string join uh, with X. Uh, actually, these are backwards, <laughs> uh, like so. And if we do this, now we get a bunch of three character strings, basically, you know, uh, joining, um, taking the first two characters and kind of joining with the last character in the middle. And now we can apply our uh, builder function to get a vector. And when we do that, we get our nice matrix here. Um, you can see that um, basically for each row of the matrix, we should have, um, oh, not uh, for each row of the matrix, when you sum them, they should all be two. And we can uh, verify that by doing an and reduce to equals. Yeah. And the, um, the maximum value, uh, this, this uh, pipe is, is max, and we're just doing a reduce, um, is two. So there are, um, there are some rows where uh, rather than having, you know, um, basically there are some rows that have, um, rather than generating two different pairs, they're generating the same pair twice. Anyway, um, so we have our matrix and we can assign this to like M for matrix. And we'll insert that here, great. And then uh, now we can do our uh, vector matrix multiplication. I can't get over how um, useful this is for all these sort of like graph or like transition, transition matrix problems. So we do like our matrix times our starting vector, and then we sum everything together. And now we get a new vector um, that has all of our our pair counts, right? Now this can be a train. Trains in uh, in GNK are quite a bit different than trains in like uh, APL, for example. Um, as far as I can tell, basically the last function in the train can be either um, can be either monadic or dyadic, meaning that they take one or two arguments, and then you just like you kind of like stack a bunch of monadic functions on top of it. So there's no, um, uh, to determine the arity of the train or how many arguments it takes, you just have to look at the last elements. And then it's kind of nice because in APL, I frequently have this situation where I'd like to use a train, but I have to do like a bunch of monadic transformations. And so I have to use, you know, like an anonymous func, uh, like a, like a defin. Um, but in K, you can just stack a bunch of monadic stuff and it's, it's not a problem. And now we can use something very akin to the power operator in APL. If we use a forward slash, which is normally reduce, but if you give it a monadic function and a number on the far left or an integer, it basically says, you know, perform this function n times, where n is the number that, that you give it. And so for part one, we wanna run it 10 times. And we can very easily do that. And this is now the, um, this vector represents the counts of each one of the pairs represented by our identifiers that, um, that appear after 10 repetitions, right? Now the problem is, um, the problem is that we need a way to convert these pair counts into uh, character counts so that we can do our our max minus min uh, function to find the, the, the problem answer. So if we convert all of our identifiers back into strings, which we can do with the uh, dollar sign function here, and then we concatenate all of them together, which you can do with concatenate reduce, we can do um, 
group once again um, to be able to get a dictionary uh, with all of the characters as keys and then with um, indices where all of the characters appear. Um, now the problem is we have basically doubled um, because we've trans uh, because we've translated each symbol, which is a scalar, into two characters. We basically doubled all of the um, indices here, right? And so we need a way to transform these indices back into um, uh, like indices of our identifiers, and we can do that using um, integer division or basically like division plus floor. And you can do that by supplying a negative integer to the um, uh, exclamation mark function here. Um, and now you can see like, we have like zero, zero, one, one, two, two. Um, so this kind of like, this kind of buckets the, the indices into our, um, uh, into our identifier list. Now be careful with this. So as everything else in, in GNK, this function is like super overloaded. Um, if you supply a positive integer here, it becomes mod, right? And then when you are doing, um, when you're supplying the negative sign for uh, negative integer literals, um, it binds more tightly than function application. So just make sure like you don't have white space here or it can mean something totally different, basically applying negate over mods. Um, anyway, we'll call this um, C for like a uh, character dict. And we'll copy this over. Do to do, do. All righty. And so check this out. If we do like our identifiers indexing into uh, C, you can see how um, like with the V character, we get all of the symbols that have V in it. And the same with uh, S and H and whatnot. And importantly, for the duplicate symbols, kind of like um, like uh, KK here, um, <laughs> I should pick a different symbol. Um, for like FF here, um, you can see that it appears twice, right? Um, which is important when we're, uh, so when we have like the counts of the symbols and we want it to, um, if, if, so for like symbol FF, if there's a thousand of them, then by including it twice in sort of the row corresponding to character F, uh, when we add them all together, then it will count as 2000, which would be correct for, for that character. Um, okay. And now we can write a function. Let's say that we run it on 10 to begin with. And the idea is that we have X times, uh, some matrix times over our starting vector, right? So these are our weights and we can, um, we can index into C uh, to get all of the, to, to basically bucket the, the um, pair counts by, by characters. And now for each one of those rows, we can uh, sum them, right? So these are all of the character counts by pairs. And, but the problem is, the problem is basically that, so like if we look at the first row of P, you can imagine mm, each one of these characters is going to be get counted twice if we're going by pairs. So like this F here is a part of VF and it's also a part of FH. And so we could just, you know, it would be nice to say, oh, we could just divide by two um, because every character is counted twice, but actually the first character and the last character are only counted once. So if we look at this and we do like a two mod, you can see that um, basically everything is even except for the first character V and the last character N. And so what we wanna do is we wanna divide by two but then we want to um, we want to use like a ceiling function uh, to be able to account for um, those those two characters, 
right? Now there's no ceiling function in, uh, in G and K, but what we can do is we can sort of get around it by negating everything and then doing that same integer division with flooring towards negative infinity. And then if we negate everything again, this kind of works, um, this basically works as like, uh, you know, integer division with, with ceiling, right? And these numbers are now our true uh, character counts. And in order to figure out the uh, maximum minus the minimum, it might be nice to have a function for that. So let's have a function called like D for diff. And the idea is that we take the uh, minimum of our arguments and we subtract it from the uh, maximum of our arguments, right? And now we can just do D uh, apply to get our part one answer of 2988. Uh, which is indeed the answer. And if we run this uh, 40 times, you get a rather larger answer, 357, 276, blah, 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 um, which is indeed our answer for part two. So let's call this function uh, f, I guess, and then we can just run it uh, for each of 10 and 40, and this gives us our uh, part one and part two answers. So we can just copy this over here, uh, like so. And this is our complete answer in NGNK for um, 2021 day 14. However, I mean, this is like, this is like pretty readable with, uh, you know, everything on its own line here. Oh, we don't have our, um, uh, we don't have our difference function. Let's get that in there. Might be faster to type it, honestly, rather than copy pasting everything. Um, however, if you look at a lot of K codes, I mean, you have this line that's like taking up a lot of width, same here. Um, you can, uh, you can separate lines using the, semicolon character, uh, like so, and maybe, um, hmm, I guess like, yeah, maybe like this. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. Now this looks. This is K right here. I feel like I look at a lot of K code, and it's just like, it's just like, it's just like a brick of code, like a very dense brick. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, this should, uh, if we uh, write this file into fourteen dot K, and we get out of our REPL here, we should be able to do dot K fourteen dot K and get our part one and part two answers. So that is NG and K. Now this final solution here does kind of look like someone knocked the serial cable loose on your VT220, but um, I don't know, I kinda, <laughs> I kinda like it. Uh, as I said before, um, I think K is really interesting. I, I get kind of like a more practical feel from it than a lot of other uh, array languages. Um, you know, features like dictionaries or the um, the uh, getting nulls on uh, outdexing. Um, this kind of stuff is like very handy when uh, when you are solving problems. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get up to speed with all the different functions and overloads and kind of like special cases. Um, but once you do, I feel like this is like uh, this is a this is a great language to do kind of generalized problem solving in. Um, and it seems to be really good for advent of code too. Actually, in GN, if you want some code examples, he uses uh, advent of code solutions for like his unit tests. So he has, you know, almost all the years here and you can just go into a directory and, um, you know, you can check these out and work through them on your own time. I think this is a really good way to 
um, to learn K and sort of some of the tricks of the trade and, and see, um, uh, you know, some, some, some good array based solutions. So anywho, that is, uh, Avid of Code 2021 day 14 in NGNK. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.